Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to my shop. Uh, I thought I'd take a minute. Uh, I've been doing some uh, pre some preventive maintenance on the coach, and I thought I'd take a few minutes and talk about a couple of things, and maybe show some specifics on the uh, Monaco Roadmaster S Series chassis. Uh, things to take a look at while you're uh, performing some routine maintenance on your coaches. Um, now, that being said. Some of this stuff is, is, is universal with the, within a diesel coach uh, or RV. Uh, other things are going to be specific to the uh, Roadmaster, in particular the S series. These are going to be pretty much anything from early 2000s to about 2009. And one way to tell is if you have Roadmaster chassis, the VIN number is going to start with a 1RF. Uh, that that's basically it means it came out of the Oregon plant. So. Now, while we're talking about this, keep in mind that the newest and what I consider the true Monaco is going to be 15 years old since they went out of business in 2009 and was bought out. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in those built after that. Um, just like the pre-2009 Monacos, the country coaches, the wander lodges, all those are going to be, in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, in my opinion, those are going to be a a different level of coach than what some of the ones you're seeing nowadays. Obviously the Wander Lodge and the country coaches are no longer built period, but even the newer Monacos are not the same as the older Monacos. So with that being said, if you're in the market for one of these older coaches, or if you already have one of these older coaches, keep in mind, like I said, the newest one is 15 years old, so more than likely you've got a 15 plus year old coach. Uh, ours is 22 years old. So they require a certain level of maintenance above and beyond what a new coach is gonna run, is, is gonna require. So this is not like uh, those of you looking to buy a coach of this of this vintage and of this caliber, don't think it's gonna be like a, a, a car you drive down to the dealership and you buy one. And there again, the dealerships that have these are maybe trying to tell you otherwise, but it's not going to be like going down and buying a car and driving out and having, you know, feeling all the warm and fuzzies because you have a warranty. In my opinion, that warranty doesn't mean crap if, they, if you're driving a, a POS. So um, when you get to that, when you get to certain ages and mileage, there's going to be certain things that are required for maintenance. I don't want to sound harsh, but a lot of the things I'm seeing on the forums and on the Facebook pages and all these things for the Monaco specific or even the even the, the, the other ones, the Alpines, the country coaches, the Wanderlog, people want to buy these because they are a, a, a well-made coach. For a, for a production coach, they were a well-made coach. But then they don't want to, they want to they have to do everything else on the cheap. And I'm just trying to, trying to explain that that's not the way to do it. If you can't afford the maintenance and the upkeep and the the, pre the preventive measures that go into these, please think twice about buying one. It, it, it breaks my heart to see one of these beautiful coaches neglected and deteriorate and just fall apart because the owners can't take proper care of them or won't take proper care of them. So take that for what whatever it's worth. But if you're gonna if you're gonna if you have one of these or if you're gonna buy one of these. Please do your diligence on your research and everything and find out what it takes to keep one of these properly maintained. If you can do all your own work, great. We're a step ahead of the game. If you have to hire it out, be aware up front that that's going to come with an added expense and you're going to have to find, you have to do your homework to find a reputable shop that's going to do the quality of work. Because most shops that work on these, I'm, not, I'm afraid to say this, I've seen a lot of repairs done by other shops and it is substandard workmanship. So they're going into it with the fact that they're going to do this, you're going to put, they're going to put, they're going to do this repair, get you on the road and they'll never see you again. So if you can build up a rapport with a local shop that you're going to use, that is a huge step in the right direction to keeping one of these things maintained. <clears throat> We've got some friends that have just sold their they had a 99 country coach that had like 217,000 miles on it when they sold it. That thing looked and ran as good, if not better, than the day it rolled off the, off the uh, assembly line. And they kept it that way because they, they bought it new, 
they maintained it and over the last I think probably 10 12 years of ownership of that coach they made sure it took that to a reputable shop every year for an annual checkup before they started their travel season things like air springs shocks chassis fluids um, running the overheads all those different kinds of things were all addressed as as required and as needed and they knew that wholeheartedly and were willing to pave a quality shop to do quality workmanship on it. So it can be done, it comes at a cost, and if those of you that, like, like myself, I don't let anybody touch my stuff, so it's, it's, a, it's, got, it's a labor of love. This is more of a lifestyle than just going down to the dealership, finding one that looks pretty, buying it, and then thinking you're gonna drive cross country without any problems. It can be done, but it takes a lot of preliminary work to make sure you're not going to have those problems. Um, my philosophy is live by the seven P's. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance, and it doesn't hold any more true than in the RV world. Properly maintaining these things and keeping them in pristine condition is what's going to prolong their life, and it's also going to add to your mental acuity when you're running a coach when you when you get in you know you turn that key you wouldn't hesitate to drive this coast to coast there's a there's, a, there's something to be said about the uh, peace of mind that that brings so um i'm going to show you a couple of things that i've got going on i won't cover like the engine per se i just did a, a where i run an overhead on it last fall before I, before i put it to bed for the winter um so if you and i did the transmission service and, and the rear end service before, uh, before that, so if you get a chance, go back to my channel and check out those couple of videos. Those will kind of show you some of the things that were required on a periodic level, as well as when you hit a certain mileage or uh, frame, like running the overhead and so forth. Uh, I'm putting new tires on it this spring before we travel, start our travel season, and I noticed last year when I was crawling underneath it, there was a few things that I wanted to address, so I've had the stuff sitting here on the shelf. And I just figured I'm going to go ahead and do this while I'm doing tires on it. So that, that brings up another point. If, you, if, you're, if you're doing your deal, due diligence on these, you should be crawling under, kind of like the roof inspections. You want to get up on your roof two, three times a year, do a, a visual inspection, put your eyes on things. You want to do the same for the underside. You want to crawl underneath these things, look around. You'd be surprised at how many major problems you can address by catching them when they're a minor issue. And a lot of it is just putting your eyes and your hands on things. Something like just grabbing a flashlight, crawling around underneath it and looking at things, looking at making sure there's nothing broken, no cracks in your, in your uh, uh, chassis components, your suspension components, making sure wires are held up out of the way, making sure they're all tucked in their wire looms. Things like that go a long ways to preventing a breakdown and costly repairs, tow bail, everything, everything else is associated with it. So I won't cover, I won't focus a lot on the engine or transmission. Uh, other than I will comment, I don't think I commented on this on the, on the overhead one, but your coolant. Uh, most of these from the early to mid 2000s came with uh, standard ethylene glycol coolant that required an SCA. That's a supplemental coolant additive. Those had to be checked every periodically. Maybe I, I, I recommend people checking them once a year, and then every couple of years the fluid the um, coolant needed exchanged, dumped, reserviced, or refilled. And then some of them had a coolant filter that had a slow release, a supplemental coolant additive that was released as, as the engine's running. The newer coaches come with a uh, either a hybrid or an organic acid technology. I switched ours over about probably 15 years ago, 13 years ago, something like that, and I've serviced it a couple times since. So I'm running an OAT, which I'm running final charge, uh, final peak final charge in ours, the global. I've also run in the previous, one of the previous times I've run the Cummins uh, Fleet Guard ES complete. Caterpillar makes one called, it's called Cat OAT. These are, they consider them lifetime coolants. I don't think anything's lifetime, but most of them have 600 to 800,000 mile service intervals, which is phenomenal. <clears throat> so I, even with those, you still want to do a check on them. Uh, I, I just got through testing ours; everything's looking good. But you still want to keep you still want to keep an eye on those. And when you do have to replenish them, you want to replenish them with the proper, or when you have to add to them or whatever, you want to make sure you're using the correct fluid. But I'm not going to get into a whole discussion on coolant, other than to say. 
know what's in your coach. If you have one of the older styles of coolant of ethylene glycol that take the SCAs, you have another level of maintenance, especially on an engine with wet sleeve uh, or, wet, or cylinder liners. Usually that's your 8.3 on up on your Cummins. Caterpillars, I believe it's the C9 on up, and it's gonna be all your Detroit, um, especially your Series 60s and your, uh, your Dole Two Strokes. Those are all gonna have liners, so those are all gonna require certain levels of uh, supplemental coolant additives or the new, um, the new coolants that don't require that. Uh, basically what that does is it's going to allow a level of protection in those engines because when coolant starts cavitating, when the, when, the, when the additive package is depleted and they start cavitating, what that does is it starts, each one of those little air bubbles, when they implode, it's like a, a, it's like a subsonic explosion going on in that coolant and it will pull material off of the outside of the liners which is the inside of the cooling system where your piston runs up and down. So all that, that pressure, those pistons going up and down in that combustion chamber is creating extreme pressures and they can build up harmonics and get bubbles going when the additive package starts depleting. And when those bubbles start imploding, that's what's happening is it's literally just pulling pieces of the inside of those liners off until all of a sudden you've got a hole in the liner and you're dumping coolant straight out through your, out through your combustion chamber and out your exhaust. At that point, you're usually pulling head, pulling liners, and it's a major, major in-frame overhaul. So to prevent all that, you want to make sure you're treating your coolant system, a cooling system properly, and um, that requires, like I said, a, a, a certain level of dedication to your cooling system. Now, um, a couple of things I noticed while I was under the coach last year, curling around, was on the ride height linkages. So. Again, this is a 22-year-old coach, but I started noticing that some of these were getting, not terrible, but they were starting to get a little cracked. And this is what hooks your axle to your ride height sensor and controls the ride height of your coach. You should most have one in the front, two in the rear. I've seen on occasion two front, two rear, but generally there's one up front, two in the rear. These are pretty easy to change. So if you're crawling around underneath and you start seeing the, the rubber pieces on them start cracking and, and tearing or the rubber getting hard and, and, and not so pliable, it's a good idea to change these because if one of these go, it will prevent your coach from airing up properly. And once you can't do that, it's a pain in the butt on the side of the road or in a campground trying to replace these. I just bought these Haldex Universal ones. The part number is a 4810225. Uh, I believe they're around 16, 18 bucks a piece. I just bought a few of these. Actually, I actually bought four of them. I bought one to carry as a spare years ago, and then I just bought three new ones um, here over the winter, and I replaced all those. So I'll bring you in and show you on the coach where those are usually located, and they're pretty simple to change. Uh, let's see, I've got my uh, center caps polished up here. Let's go over and I'll show, I'll, I'll grab your handheld and I'll walk in and kind of show you a few different odds and ends. Those of you that follow me on several of the forums know that I'm a huge proponent of these uh, Balance Masters. Uh, they're very similar to the Centromatics. The difference being is the Centromatics uses steel balls in the rings, um, whereas the Balance Masters use a heavy metal, such as like a mercury in the outer ring, so they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty quiet. The Centromatics, you can kind of hear <clears throat> the swishing a little bit as the balls are running around those up to I don't know 10 12 miles per hour then they s kind of sling out and, sl and uh, reposition and you don't hear them anymore but at low speeds driving through campgrounds stuff like that you can sometimes hear them swishing around in the rings whereas these are pretty these are virtually silent so I'm a huge proponent of these let's put it that way I've had them on my last coach our beaver for seven years and I've had them on this for 17 years now so I scuffed uh, scuffed them down and repainted them. They're all ready to go back on. The fronts were in pretty uh, rough condition of the mating surface, so I actually took a DA and sanded them down and repainted them. Uh, those of you who follow me also know I'm a huge proponent <coughs> of cross crossfires. These connect your inner and outer duals on the air pressure so that you can maintain proper balance and air pressure between the inner duel and the outer duel. Something as simple as a 5 16 diameter 
or a 5 16 inch circumference difference from an inner duel to an outer duel can result in you're dragging that smaller tire about 13 feet per mile because they're bolted together. So you, and, and the inside duel always runs hotter because there's less air passing by it, plus it's closest to your, your brake system. So it's, it's nearly impossible to keep those tire pressures equalized without some type of a system like this. There's another one called Cat Eyes. They've been around a little bit longer, but I've run these crossfires, like I said, on our first coach, or our first diesel for 17 years. I had them on my gasser before that. And so I've been running these over 30 years now. I believe my first ones were cat eyes. Then I moved to Crossfire with our last coach, our first diesel, and I'm running and running cat eyes on these. So those will all go back on as I'm putting the tires on. Let's see. So as I come around here to the RV bay, here's all of our new tires. Now here, I'm gonna see if I can shine a light in here and show where the lift, where the ride height linkage is on this one, it's right there. You can kind of see it between the axle and then the ride height switch is right above it. it. Might be kind of hard to see. Also, while you're underneath there, check for things such as your welds, where all your suspension components meet. I generally go through and give all those a good once over. Check your air springs for. Um, usually, these will start deteriorating at the rolls, top or bottom. You have, on the, on the S-Series, you're gonna have four airbags up front. The outer rear of the H-frame, at front and rear, on both sides. Also check things like your airlines, your air hoses going to your, your cams for your brakes. Make sure all those are in good shape. While you're at it, it's a good time to dump your air pressure, or uh, bleed the tanks. There's a tank right there, the petcock below it. This one here has a hose that goes up with a valve right up by the side of the generator. So you can give that a couple of burps a few times a year. You should not get any moisture out of them. If you have moisture coming out of those, then that means that your air dryer, your cartridge for your air dryer is at capacity and saturated and needs to be replaced. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get around to that back side. Um, there you can kind of see Let's see, see my watts link that I installed on the back. I've kind of I've drilled and tapped them into some plates that I fabricated. So that's one of the linkages. The other one's on the upper on the other side and it mounts right behind the generator to the H frame. That controls the movement of that as it's going up and down. That's a, a big improvement on these, more so on the RR8 R chassis and the RR8M. RM chassis that uh, did not have the tag axle. The tag axle seems to take a lot of that out, but I fabricated one for mine and put it on about uh, nine, 10 years ago now, more or less to see what kind of effects it would have on an S series chassis with a tag axle. I've been pleased with it, but it's, it's I don't feel it's required on these, but if you want, I, I would put the way this coach handles up against pretty much anything of the higher end, like a either a Wander Lodge or a Newell or a Prevo. I think I've driven those and I feel it handles every bit as good with having that, uh, that Watts link on there. And, and then, and it makes you just making sure all your bushings are in good shape. So you want to check all of your, your bushings, your control arm links. I replaced these with the Atro 1000s about 12, 15 years ago. Okay. Let's continue around. All right. Let's come around. Here's my new toils that I'm putting on. I've polished the wheels all up, so they're all on, looking good, ready to go back on the coach. Um, oh, one thing I didn't cover. If you're running wet hubs on the front, now would be a good time to also check, and you wanna check these fluids a couple times a year. Uh, so if you're running greased on the front, no big deal. You still wanna have them serviced occasionally, but if you're running wet hubs, I recommend 20 to 25,000. I think Monaco calls 25 to 30. I generally like to do it a little sooner than that. Um, mine ends up being about every four years I'll do mine, which equates to in that 20 to 25,000 mile range. They're simple to service. You pull the plug out, 
turn that down to the six o'clock position, let it all drain. I usually put a forma funnel up underneath there so you don't get oil all over your, your hubs and your uh, flanges. Let it drain. I usually set mine, I do an axle at a time and set it and let it drain overnight. Then come back in, put your plug in. Then you pop the center cap and you fill it with uh, GL5 lubricant of your choice until it gets above the fill line. Now you want to, you, when you fill these, you don't want to just fill it and walk away. You want to fill it because it has to flow in to all through those bearings. And then sometimes I'll even rotate it a couple of times to make sure and coat all the bearings and then let it stabilize. And it'll lower, you put some more in. You want to make sure, and there's two lines there. I run it to the, to the centermost line as, as the full level. Once that's equalized and done, then you go ahead and put your cap back on and you're good. Same for your tag axle. Tag axle is going to be the same way. Your drive axle obviously is lubed through the differential. So I've already serviced that last fall. But that, that service is a, it's a full floating axle just like on a three quarter or one ton light duty truck. The oil is moved out from the center section, the carrier differential, out to the axle bearings. Tag axle, same way. Dump, pull your plug, turn this to the six o'clock position, let it drain, and then go ahead and fill it through the center there. This one might be a little easier to see. See if it shows up. You've got to put a light on this to see if it helps. You have a outermost line, which is your ad line. You have an innermost line, which is your full line. So you want to be between those two lines. Also, while you're crawling around underneath, look at the back sides of your hubs and make sure there's no oil on the back side of your brakes. I usually t check that a couple, three times a year. I'll crawl underneath this thing when I'm doing my uh, uh, routine crawling around underneath them. I'll check for those uh, back of those seals, make sure there's none leaking. On the tag axle coaches, again, this is on the S series. This is specific to um, the Roadmaster, but I believe Country Coach and even some of your Prevos have a liftable tag. You'll want to make sure and check the, they use a brake canister to raise and lower the tag when it gets air pressure. They have a chain. Some of them will have a link. I think most all of them have a chain. I put foam or I put hose zip tied around mine just because it controls, in case that rattling out when there's uh, weight down on it and the chain is slacked it takes that rattle out i hate driving under overpasses or along k rails on the on the roads and you're hearing those chains back there rattling so i covered mine to protect that now also while i'm right here let me see if i can let me see if i can show i'm sorry if i'm moving this camera all over the place I'm trying to get in here to show where I made an alteration to my uh, vertical supports. Now on these S-Series chassis, this vertical support right here that, can, that your, lower your upper and lower control arms for your drive axle attach to, they sometimes have a tendency to break where they, they basically just butt up against the frame rail. And I've seen some on some of the forums that have broken and it's uh, quite an extensive repair. So uh, again, we bought, this is a 2003, it was fabricated, in, it was built in February of 22 is when it come off the assembly line. I, we bought it in February of 07. So it was four model years, five years old when we bought it. And I kind of learned this stuff over the years just by following and working on a lot of these. I don't work on as many these days, but I have worked on quite a few of these over the years. And I started seeing some of those cracks. And in 08, so 09 model years, I noticed that Roadmaster had added a gusset, like a backbone to this. And it's basically just a piece of 3 8 inch plate that runs vertical. Runs vertical from here all the way up and it gets slightly wider. It's about, uh, it's probably an inch and a half wide down here and it's about almost four inches wide at the top. I'm just gonna show up real great up in here. 
So when I saw that in 08, uh, I, I had a pretty good relationship with our Monaco dealer, and there was one here locally. So whenever he got new coaches in, he was he had he was awesome about letting me uh, come in and crawl around them and look at them. So I got to see this progression of the coaches and the chassis and so forth over the years. So when I noticed that, I immediately I kind of took a pattern and added it to ours, and then I constantly keep eye on the welds and everything else I, I did I welded them I made sure I got them all burned in good but I still check them uh, routinely uh, let's see what else oh so those of you who also follow my videos there's where I made the uh, lengthening of my lower control on the upper one's kind of hard to see but when I corrected my thrust angle on this coach because I had a pull to the right I lengthened the end of these about an eighth of an inch to get that thrust angle corrected. And then I also did the tag axle so because they were both even distance. So I went ahead and corrected all that. That helped tremendously. You can let go of the wheel and this thing will track straight down the road. I actually added a little bit of thrust because we generally travel, we prefer to travel on two lane country roads where there's a crown on the road and so they have a natural tendency to want to drift off to the right. I actually added a little bit so that it kind of pushed it to the center of the road. On two-lane roads, it handles great. On flat concrete interstate, it will slowly, oh, over a period of probably, I don't know, five or six lengths, it'll start drifting ever so slightly to the left uh, if you let go of the wheel. Holding onto the wheel, I mean, it's one thing you're driving is usually on these things they just it, it, this thing handles so well but it does on flat interstate will slowly start drifting to the left but on two lane highway it holds on that crown perfectly again you want to make sure come in and check your bushings um, where these links connect here you can see this is where i lengthened the tag axle and right there lengthen the tag axle um, also while you're under here check your coolant not only your rubber hoses, I replaced these a few years back when I did my whole cooling system, but they connect to steel tubes that run the run up around uh, to loop around, and then there's short sections between the engine and the tubes. Keep an eye on those; those have a tendency to rust, rust and rot out. Mine were a little pitted from road spray and gravel and stuff like that kicking up on them when I pulled mine all apart and changed all the hoses. So I sanded mine down, wire wheeled them and painted them with a poor 15 and I keep an eye on them but uh, those are not available to anybody or those are not available from anybody I'm I'm at some of. point to have to build build those when the time comes but um, till that time comes so they're, they're staying pretty uh, in pretty good condition just after being painted now the thing I want to show you underneath this specifically is the on these S series they have a tendency to bury the uh, air dryer right behind the tag axle on the driver's side. So that's going to be your street side right inside the frame rail. Let me see if that shows up. You should, yeah, you should be able to see the new cartridge right there. These can be a pain to change because they're up between the transmission, your lower control arm, you've got your air, air springs, you've got your brake chambers, you've got all this crap in, in here in the way and that air dryer is not very accessible. If you're in a wet climate, I highly recommend two to three years replacing those. We're in a fairly arid climate here out west. I change mine every four years, roughly, oh, I don't know, 25 to 30. I usually do them about the same time. I do it at the same time I do my hubs because I pull my tires and wheels off the tag axle. And that's the best, the easiest way to get to this. So if you have this left rear tag, tire and wheel out of the way, there's three bolts that hold that bracket onto the, the or excuse me, hold that air dryer onto the bracket that's welded to the frame. You have two bolts up here, and one you cannot see, but is right pretty much even with this upper control arm for your tag axle. Loosen that single bottom one, pull those two out. They're half inch 13 bolts. They require a three quarter inch socket. Pull those two bolts out, loosen that bottom one. That air dryer will pivot out 
or pivot forward rather on that center bolt. Then I just take and stick this bolt back in and it kind of holds it there and it puts that cartridge right here in this opening right behind the air spring for the tag axle. You can put a strap wrench on it, break it loose, pull it apart, clean the mating surface, get your new one prepped, put your O-ring on that comes with a little bit of uh, silicon lubricant. So you put a little bit of the silicone on the O-ring, on the mating surface of that O-ring, and put it back on, tighten it, and then pull that bolt out, pivot it back up, put the two upper bolts in, Tighten them, tighten that one, boom, you're done. Easy peasy. That is the best way I've found to change that air dryer cartridge on these. But it does require removing this tag. So uh, I've got the coach up on my 22-ton jack stands. And then I just have some 6-ton jack stands supporting the weight of the axles right now. But that that is the best way I've found to change that air dryer cartridge. And it pretty much makes it a non-event curbside here i wanted to show you where those linkages those ride height linkages are on the rear axle they're just inside of the uh control arm upper lower control arms or trailing arms as monaco calls them right there is the upper one where your ride height valve is and it connects down to the axle with the drive tires out of the way it's an easy job to change that so that's why i went ahead and did it if not um you have to go up underneath and you can kind of get up between the brake chamber and the axle and reach up between there. It is a little more cumbersome because you have to have long arms. It's not really spaces, that it's kind of tight in there. So I just figured while I had the tires and wheels and everything off that I would go ahead and do it now. Again, here's your airbags for your drive axle, front, rear. The tag axle bags are inboard mounted right there. So, yeah, right there, those are the only inboard mounted ones was on the tag axle, everything else. So keep an eye on these rolls, on these upper and lower rolls. These bags are just barely two years old now because I just replaced those in March of 21. But go ahead and get everything a good once over while you're under here. Again, check where your brackets for your suspension mounts, weld onto the frame, or weld onto the H frame, as well as weld on up to the frame. Here you can see better that vertical piece from the other side where I was showing you that comes up and it's welded up to the frame. And on the back side, you can see the backbone that I added top to bottom. Again, the smaller jack stands, the six-ton ones, are only holding the weight of the axle up. They're not holding the coach up, so don't freak out. Again, hubs are serviced. So all the chassis, all the chassis maintenance on this is done and ready to go. I have just over 140,000 miles on this coach now, and uh, wife and I are shooting for 200. We want to hit that 200,000 mark. That means we've had a lot of fun in it, so we want to... That's what we're shooting for. While we're on the subject of hub fluids, uh, replacing the uh, fluids in your wet hubs, when you're draining it, take a flashlight and bathe across the oil and check for any abnormalities. Uh, a, a little, very, very little, little sparkles are okay. As normal wet, there's normal wear. Um, but when you start seeing that whole metallic look coming out, silver or worse chunks and flakes you might as well stop plan on pulling the hub apart because um, something's failing in there so just a little tip I, I, I set a clean pan under each one and I'll drain it and then I'll pull it out and kind of tip it and look in the light and then clean them out and then move to the other axle. So I've got one under each side of the tag, get it done, then move forward. And while the front's draining, then I'll fill the tag and vice versa. So um, anyway, that's just how I do them. Now, when you do need to take these apart and put them back together, some manufacturers will say, torque the inner nut to a certain torque, back off one flat or 90 degrees, 60 degrees, whatever, depending on the thread pitch of the spindle. That's a good starting point. However, the specs on these are one to five thousandths 
end play. That's .001 to .005 of end play. That's in and out movement on that hub. So I'll usually set a dial indicator on a spindle, set the plunger of the dial indicator over here to the hub, or vice versa, it doesn't matter how you measure it. You just wanna measure that in and out lateral play on that, and you don't want it too tight, because a tight bearing will fail. Too loose is just gonna, well, it's gonna end up failing anyway too, but take a seal out first probably. But when you set it, make sure you set, double check it when you torque that outer nut. Like I say, the inner one, if I remember right, these, it goes to like 50 foot pounds, and then you back it off so much per thread, and that'll get you pretty close. But when you put the lock washer on, and that outer nut, and you torque that to either 250 or 300, depending on whether, depending on what uh, axle you're working on, it'll be around 250 to 300 foot pounds, what you tighten that outer knuckle. It's gonna shift it ever so slightly to the inside of the 60 degree thread pitch. So keep that in mind. A lot of times when you get a feel for it, you'll just go through, okay, I'll set it up at say two and a half to three thousandths on the first one. Then when you torque that outer nut, it might land on about one and a half to two thousandths. So keep that in mind. You want to double, you want to set it up initially. Then when you torque that outer one, double and triple check it. Make sure that you're within that one to five thousandths in play. Okay, so we're back here at the engine bay. So as I've mentioned, uh, I'm trying to blind you there. I've actually done some cosmetic stuff back here. I've added some polished stainless covers to both my rear run panels, my aluminum surge tank. I've got a video on when I built that, but that I had polished before I installed it. So when you're back here, you wanna check, make sure you have good air cleaner in it. You wanna make sure that your air cleaner tubes are all properly connected and there's no gaps because if you suck dirt and dust into that, that is a surefire way, it's called dusting an engine, but that is a surefire way to start really damaging the uh, pistons and inside of your cylinders on these engines. Another thing to keep an eye on while you're back here is your belts. You should have an AC belt and then a serpentine belt. Make sure your belts are in good shape. Batteries, same thing. I also go in and coat mine with some NOCO, um, corrosion protection, but make sure your batteries are in good shape. Uh, let's see, I've added a fuel gauge to my filter number three before it goes to the caps because I'm running a fast fuel pump system on this. So make sure you check all those connections. Just give everything a good once over. Like I say, a lot of times you can find an issue, make sure all your, your wire looms are properly secured, make sure everything's away from your belt train, just putting eyes and hands on things go a long, long way to ensuring um, happy vacations and not breakdowns. I think that's all, all I have. Oh, one other thing. When you're back here cleaning, I've seen this several times on a couple of the forums. When you're back here cleaning or doing just normal routine maintenance, you can start the coach from back here. You have a, uh, if that's on rear, you have to have the key on, but you can start it from back here. I see people bump that once in a while, and then they have a no start condition when they get up front. So if you've been messing around back here, and all of a sudden you have a no start condition, please check that first. It's a good possibility you might have bumped that, especially if you're if you're holding this or something trying to, while you're trying to um, connect your uh, rear run panels. It's not uncommon to bump that switch. Uh, let's see, I think that's everything. Keep an eye on your, say your coolant level. I've, I've got a sight glass that I, I built into the side of mine. Some of them have just got uh, the plastic bottles. You can see where the coolant line is. If you do have a plastic bottle, keep a very close eye on those. They have a tendency to start cracking, especially now, like I said, the newest ones are 15 years old. I rebuilt mine. I think it was probably six, seven years ago I built my aluminum one. I think there are companies now that you can buy these from, but I highly recommend going with a steel or an aluminum one rather than the plastic. And that's a good item to change before it breaks and leaves you. So keep, keep that in mind. Well, that, uh, that concludes the, what I wanted to cover on the Roadmaster S-Series chassis maintenance. It was not all inclusive. It was just kind of a rough overview. While I had my tires and wheels off, I hope it was informative. I hope it 
encourages you to go out and become personal with your with your with your Monaco. Um, crawl underneath it, look around. Um, if you, the more the more times you put eyes on something, the more you're going to look at something and know when something's not right. If you know what good looks like underneath, and you crawl underneath there and you see a wire, you see something that doesn't look right. You're more apt to, to it's more apt to catch your eye than looking under it once every five years or paying somebody else to look under it. Now, if you are fortunate enough to have that kind of discretionary income, you can take this to a shop, great, I commend you for that. But I still would encourage you to know your rig because there are shops out there, and I hate to say this, being a, a, a mechanic my whole life, there are shops out there that will prey particularly on our beers knowing that they'll probably never see you or that coach again. So if you can build up a rapport with a local shop, rather than having to deal with stuff when you're out on the road, I think that's a I think that's a win-win. I think it's a win for you. It's a win for the coach. And in all honesty, it's a win for the deal, for the, uh, the the shop because I know what it's like. I, I had my own business for 20 years, and I know what it's like having those loyal customers, the ones that if. You, you know what they're going to do even before, almost before they do. When you're working, uh, when I'm working on something, I knew my clientele, and I knew, hey, money's a little tight for him. This needs to be addressed right away. This, this, and this can probably wait a little while. That's how I present it and let them make the decision, but I kind of already knew that. Um, then there was others that they wanted anything and everything that did not look right. They wanted it fixed right then and there, no questions asked. I absolutely love those clients. But those are few and far between. So again, I just I wanted to just at least shed a light on what kind of things to look for and what kind of things not to overlook. Hub fluids, difference, some of the stuff like the, the transmission service and the engine overhead. I covered those in other videos, so I didn't spend a lot of time on them here. If you have questions about those, go check out those other couple videos. I tried to cover them pretty in depth on how to run the overhead and how to service the transmission, but this was mainly dealing with things to look for in the chassis, and it definitely is easier with the tires and wheels off the coach. So I think I'm pretty much ready. I, I definitely need to do a little, get the paint. The paint's seven years old this year, and I got a few water spots and a few things. We got caught in the campground last year that uh, the sprinklers and the wind blew, and I played hell getting water spots off. I think I finally got the water spots off, but I think I need to go through and give the paint a little attention, a little, a little love this year before we start traveling. But other than that, I think it's ready to go. So I hope I see some of you down on the road. If, you, if we're out and about and you see us, please stop by and say hi. And uh, again, if this, if this video was helpful, please leave a comment and give me a like. And I, and I hope you subscribe for future videos coming. Thank you very much.